What's up, everyone? Welcome to the first Card Advantage video under our new name. Uh, obviously, we are formerly Tim Team Kitchen Fable. Go watch our quick reband announcement if you want to know about the details of it. But uh, we're here to tell to you about, fittingly, uh, how to get Card Advantage and how to analyze turn cycles in Flesh and Blood. Um, so I think a lot of people know, even from the basics, what kind of turn cycle math is like. But throughout the rest of this video, we're going to go more in depth about uh, turn cycles and give some guidelines of analyzing them and just some introductions to them. Obviously, there's so many different effects in flesh and blood that um, every turn cycle looks different. There's always different math to be applied. Um, but I think there's quite a few foundational things that you can start looking at that are a little bit more advanced than just doing your basic math. So I am going to just to introduce it, show what basic math on a turn cycle looks like. Uh, what we have here is just you count your blocks and you count how much damage you dealt and then basically add and subtract the two to see what value you got. Uh, we have a Phi versus a Bravo here. The Phi comes in with a three damage attack, which goes through a three damage attack, which does not go through. It gets blocked by three blaze headlong, which ships for one Phoenix flame, which ships for one and breaking point, which ships for two. So in total, the five presented 16 damage off of four cards. Uh, obviously, they pitched a blue. I didn't show that in the graphic. Um, they pitched a blue to pay, pay for the Ember Blade and the Breaking Point. And uh, so that's the blue plus the three reds. And then on the Bravo side, the Bravo blocked with three, blo three, three blocks and then saved the last card to attack for four with the Anothos. So the 16 damage turn was reduced to chipping through for seven but the Bravo uh, saved his last card to attack for four. Obviously, if he had blocked with that last card, it could have blocked three, but attacking for four is a little bit better. Um, maybe the Bravo could have done something else on this cycle, like cast the Blessing of Deliverance, but this is just to mm -hmm. kind of illustrate the basics of turn cycle math. You say that I took seven damage and I dealt four, so on this turn cycle, I actually lost by three. So a lot of people know the basics of how this type of turn cycle worked, but from here on out, we're gonna add kind of little things you can add on, little tricks and ways to adjust your math and things to keep an eye out for. So Steven's gonna start us off with that. Yeah, cool. And then I'm going to start talking about equipment and how to factor in uh, how to factor equipment into your turn cycles. Uh, equipment. You should look at it as part of your life total that will help you um, to get into those nasty breakpoints that could add value to your opponent. Uh, if you use your equipment appropriately, you will see that you'll be able to deny the value of cards by a good margin. You just have to pick your battles on when to use it. Um, and then a really good example of that would be uh, the Mavrian Skies from Runeblade. Um, if you use... If, if your opponent comes in with Mavrian Skies and let's say a 4 damage attack, um, then you block with a card from your hand and your equipment that blocks for 1. Um, your That whole portion of your block, your 4, actually blocked for 7. It's important for you to look at it this way because those are the little math advantages that can kind of make it so your turn cycles are just not as effective as they should be. So once again, make sure you use your equipment appropriately to stop opponents uh, great, good on hit effects that could give them extra value. Yeah. So even if that card you blocked with would have dealt four damage on your turn, if it you use it to True. block three plus another four on your opponent's turn, even though you may be an aggro deck and you're trying to deal damage, uh, winning on the turn cycle there is pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. I also want to note when you count your equipment blocks, uh, don't fool yourself into thinking that if you blocked four damage with equipment that you took four less damage on that turn cycle, you should mm -hmm. take into account the equipment as part of your life total because it is an opportunity cost. Either you use it now or later. So if you took three damage to your equipment, you should take you should count that as taking three damage on that turn cycle when you're doing math in your head for if you think you're going to get an advantage or not. Yeah. So the next one I wanted to add was instead of damage on hits, like Steven showed us Mavrin Skies, I wanted to talk about the Command and Conquer on hits. Um, so on hits in general are just like one of the biggest ways that the turn cycle gets adjusted. Um, and it's like a hidden, it's a hidden thing because with Mavrian Skies, it's very obvious. You've got three extra damage if it hit. Um, so you just add that to your turn cycle. But with Command and Conquer with an entire card getting destroyed, even though that card getting destroyed doesn't translate to damage, it does translate to damage taken by your opponent. So a uh, very simple example is... If you have a scar for scar in your arsenal and you're like lower life and your opponent is coming at you with command and conquer either you can block with uh 
like two, three blocks, maybe the let's just make it super simple. Uh, the two cards in your hand would deal four damage to your opponent if you used them. Um, and the card in your arsenal would deal four damage. So, like it's a scar for <laughs> scar. If you yeah. take the command and conquer, you take six damage and you lose the scar for scar, meaning you're going to deal four less damage to your opponent. That's a life swing of 10 total. Instead, if you block with two, three blocks from your hand, if they were both going to do four, that means you didn't take damage, but you're dealing eight less damage. So that's only a life swing of eight. So this is kind of to illustrate on the math side of things that a lot of times you might think that you're just going to take the command and conquer and only lose one card and deal more. And it is true in a lot of scenarios, you're going to deal more damage if you just take the command and conquer, but it also meant you took more damage. So you can either have a life swing of eight where you blocked the command and conquer or a life swing of 10 where you let the command and conquer hit. Obviously, the stage of the game matters. If you're threatening lethal, maybe it's better to let it hit and threaten way more lethal. Uh, but I think in the early game, doing these little, this two life difference could add up at the end of the game. Yeah, I would go as far as to say that the you blocking with two cards that do four damage um, for six actually is a two point difference of value there since you are blocking six with your cards. So you have to look at it uh, very broadly in that way. So it, that's why most of the time it's very convenient to block with command, uh, the Command and Conquer completely because it is uh, more value for you as a player getting hit by Command and Conquer. Um, uh, other effects can really be detrimental to make Command and Conquer lose value, and that's kind of what you want. Um, but yeah, just a two-point different, I would say, is a, is a way to look at it as well. Yeah. Block command yeah, and conquer. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of other on hit effects in the game. Like there's snatch, um, there's mask of momentum. So all of these on hit effects adapt your turn cycle. Ones that draw you cards means that your opponent might deal four more damage. So if you were to block that, you can save yourself an extra entire four life uh, if you block a draw on hit effect. Um, so aside from on hit effect, the next thing I wanted to add to turn cycles is when you over block and when your opponent is left with cards in hand. So uh, the main time this comes into effect is when your opponent is heavy on attack reactions. Perfect example is Dorinthia. Uh, I'm going to lay out a scene where your opponent is coming at you with a Dawnblade for six on hit go again. Maybe they have like one resource floating, one card in hand, and one in arsenal. Say you have perfect knowledge that the card in their arsenal is a D-React and the card in their hand is an Iron Song response. And in your hand, you have three cards that can block for three each and then a blue and your Bravo conveniently. Um, so your opponent's coming at you with Dawnblade. If you let it hit, they're going to just deal another Dawnblade attack after that. But what you can do is overblock the Dawnblade for nine and they're disincentivized from casting the Iron Song response because it's not going to affect the turn cycle. It's not going to deal any more damage. Um, but it does mean that you're not going to take damage and you get to hammer them on your next turn. Uh, what I want to illustrate with this example is even though you're blocking a six power attack for nine power uh you're over blocking it and it seems like you're losing value there like at if you just look at a basic turn cycle you over blocked by three but the big difference that comes into effect here is that you just forced the dorinthia to end her turn with a card in hand meaning that she mm -hmm. only used three cards um and her over or your over block like your waste of a card is evened out by her wasting a card and she didn't leak any damage on that turn um, so all your three cards are even there. And then on your turn, you hammer for four. If she blocks for three, you win the turn cycle like by one exactly. Um, but the basic example here is just if your opponent or you are ever in a cycle where you are forced to hold a card in hand, that's like it's very bad to hold cards in hand because you're just used one entire less card on your cycle where it would have been better for you to block with that card. Um, blocking is like the most obvious uh corollary of yeah. what you should have done with it but uh yeah just holding cards in hand or when you can force your opponent to hold a card in hand is ideal like another example is when they're coming in with meet and greet and their creepers is dead and they have a card in hand if you just use one card to stop the arcane damage that's coming in the meet and greet will not have go again and they can't use their other card to attack you so like i think a lot of time viscera is not going to do that because it's very obvious that if you stop the arcane their turn is over and they have a card left in hand Mm -hmm. um but those are situations to look out for where the numbers are a little bit deceiving but cards in hand uh reveal the truth of you winning the turn cycle um in that instance very true i think in flesh and blood in in general you want to be using all your cards during each turn cycle if you're ever 
over blocking or under blocking i think that's a good thing that you need to be aware of once you're playing flesh and blood uh kind of in, in the wild uh just every if you find a use for every card be it blocking or attacking with and then using them effectively it's that's how you get good turns yeah <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um and a way to stop good turns from the opponent would be uh with taxing effects uh, when they matter the most, they will be stopping a whole card uh, worth of damage. And, and in this case, and the way that we've been talking about throughout the whole video, we value a card as uh, four damage each. So if you stop four damage, you're stopping a whole card's worth of value. In this case, uh, a very simple example is if the opponent Viscerai comes in with uh, their three-card hand with Marvius guys pitching a blue, doing a two-cost attack, threatening to attack with Rosetta Thorn. If you give them one frostbite, that is that one frostbite, that taxing effect is preventing four damage, which the Rosetta would come for, and you can then block the rest of the attack as needed. Uh, but you can see the big effect of that taxing effect did in helping you win that turn cycle. Um, inversely, a bad way to use a taxing effect would be if an opponent went, uh, an opponent Bravo, which Jacob here knows very well, uh, <laughs> pitches into getting a seismic surge token. Uh, they have two floating. You give them one tax, and they still swing, use their other card to swing Anathos for six. You didn't stop anything from them. Maybe the taxing effect allowed you to deal one more damage with your uh, Waning Moon or maybe another Arcane damage that you might have done. Um, but it, them dealing you six damage is a big enough swing that uh, you need to be careful, and you need to evaluate that in the turn cycle when you're giving a, a, the Frostbite. There's a lot of layers here, but... Uh, you need to think about if it is it worth it to give them a frostbite, especially if they have such a breadth of resources like Bravo. Yeah, and from the other from the opponent's perspective, you need to uh, evaluate if that frostbite is gonna do that much of a problem to you. So if you do have that three card hand as Viscerai, and your opponent has a card in Arsenal and their Icelander, um, mm -hmm. I think it's almost better to just maybe block less. Than, like if you have a three card because you blocked, maybe you shouldn't have blocked, or you should have blocked more. Because you know your opponent is going to stop your entire Rosetta and get really good value from their um, Frostbite. Maybe you need to block a little bit more and do like one attack and Arsenal a card instead and do a little bit of a setup. Um, so taking into account tax effects and how they affect the turn cycle is another thing to really keep in mind. And uh, Steven has one more thing, which is a more advanced turn cycle that he's going to show us now. Yep. We're going to do uh, one of the heroes I've been playing a lot, which is the Icelander. Uh, so a great as Icelander turn cycle that you could do is you have, you pitch your blue, you block clean a clean four, one card four versus one card four, which is uh, the Sigil of Permafrost here. Uh, you fuse it, then you play your Frosting, and then if you want to get really cheeky with it, you go ahead and layer that and play uh, activate your Winning Moon first so the bigger damage number comes out and uh, they get more frostbites. And they already got a frostbite from me, from the frost thing being played as well. So you got three taxing effects, uh, uh, assuming the opponent only has one AB because they're, they're playing uh, a red heavy deck with like Blaze Headlong in it anyway. Um, plus you're dealt one damage there, and then you threatened, you, you threatened in this scenario four damage. Um, you see how each card uh, just gains you value in the sense that the Frostbite stops the opponent from using their cards, which is a concept that we talked about earlier. And if they get with left with card, extra cards in their hand, it's life that you saved as the Icelander player. And then in that same turn cycle, you come to your turn with the three card, with the two card hand of Encase and uh, another blue. And then you play the Encase, you fuse it, and that has its own value. And then you kind of try as Icelander to just keep snowballing from there to attempt to stop the opponent from. Uh, gaining the max value from their cards. So that's what you do as Icelander. And with Frost Hex, uh, your Frost Spikes actually deal even more value, um, which if you math it all out, which just comes to uh, an advantage for the Icelander player. Yeah, so as the game kind of expands and the card pool gets bigger, there's going to be even more effects to take into account. Like Icelander, even though we had Kano before, which plays on the opponent's turn, now we have Icelander, which plays on the opponent's turn and introduces tax effects. Like Kano is just all damage the entire time with some beneficial mm -hmm. on it effects for himself. Um, but now that we have tax effects to take into account, we have board state, which is frost hex, uh, and we have playing on both opponents' turns. The turn cycle gets a little bit more hard to define, but it's still just as important to 
um, take advantage of and be aware of and make sure you're getting positive trades on the turn to turn basis. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and show one last example. And uh, interestingly enough, this is starts with getting negative turns on a turn to turn basis, um, but ending with winning the game. So uh, <laughs> important. The whole video, we were talking about how to try to get positive uh, turn cycles, how to take advantage of certain cards, how to negate on hit effects um, and make sure you're winning turn to turn. But there are some decks in the game like Guardians, uh, mainly Oldham and Bravo, which a lot of times are going to look like they're losing turn to turn. Not so much Oldham because he does a lot of disruption, um, but we're going to go all the way back to Welcome to Wraith Days with Bravo. And just like the turn cycle I showed you at the beginning, Bravo lost that turn cycle by three. He took seven damage and only dealt four. Um, and not every turn is going to look like that. Like the five dealt 16 damage that turn. Not every aggro deck is always going to get four damage per card. But what Bravo does is set up his late game. So if you can set up in your pitch stack, uh, you have like multiple cripplings in a row, or you have like a crippling and then a spino followed by a pummel and then another crippling and then like a terra sunder or arouse the ancients to start threatening their life total. Um, the pattern of that game looks like you are losing quite a few turn cycles in the early game you're leaking damage to yourself and by the time you get to the bottom of your deck where you've stacked attacks whether you stacked it with sink below or every once in a while you do a hammer for six where you pitch a red and a blue um mm -hmm. you may have lost like 10 turn cycles maybe 10 turn cycles you took three extra damage and now you're on 10 life but you have like what is it like 12 12 life on your equipment to block with um mm -hmm. and you have a bunch of disruption effects ready if your opponent is on like maybe 25 or 30 because all you've been doing is chipping with hammer every once in a while, uh, you're at like a 25 life deficit. All of a sudden you have dominate crippling, spinal pummel, pummeled spinal, and then a terra sunder and then a crippling or whatever. That life deficit is going to change so fast because how strong your effects are and the fact that you can snowball disruption back to back. So I wanted to end the video with talking about maybe it's okay to lose on a turn to turn basis if you have a plan to win at the end of the game and there's mm -hmm. other heroes that do this where they might lose on a turn to turn basis but they're setting up a board state like prism used to do um or icelander with frost texas or dromai with dragons or a pitch stack like bravo does where it's not always it's not always correct to laser focus on winning every single turn cycle if you know your plan is to win at a certain point in time and uh, so that's just another way to look at it. It's always important to recognize and do the math on your turn cycles and check out what's happening, check out the on hit effects. Um, but it's just another way to think about it and another type of game plan and how you can try to win. It's quick math, do your turn cycles correctly and you will win games. Yeah, definitely. Just combine all of these things and also be creative. Like like I said earlier, the, the, card, the card pool is so big and we talked about mm -hmm. like maybe 10 different cards in this video. And there's hundreds of cards and there's many different on hit effects. There's many different types of board states um, and different heroes and ways that they do damage and ways that they block damage. So just keep in mind all of those types of things. Keep them in mind when you're building your deck and when you're playing your deck. And I think it's going to help you see a lot of success when you're playing Flesh and Blood. Um, so that's all we have to say today. If you enjoyed the video, definitely like and subscribe. We are Team Card Advantage formerly known as Team Kitchen Fable. Uh, <laughs> keep an eye out for more videos. We're still streaming every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we're doing Classic so Instructed right now, but every once in a while we switch back to Blitz. Um, and we appreciate you guys hanging out with us and talking to us during that time. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. Peace.